Okay, it's day 103 of this honeydew germination experiment. So everything is going really well these days, and this most dominant plant is fiercely pumping out as many leaves and tendrils as it can. And it's exhibiting strong phototropism upwards. It's got long tendrils that are kind of whipping all over the place, even onto itself, looking for things to bind to. The second one is not doing bad either. It's coming along more slowly, but it's definitely developing faster and faster. So this is the very interesting scene of this long tendril from plant number one, binding and coiling around um, plant number two's stem. And you know, although I've been calling this a phone cord, essentially these plants have had tendrils for millions and millions of years, um, far before telephones and civilization were ever invented. So it's the other way around, you know. Telephone cords are essentially copies of tendrils. So what this spring formation does is exactly that. It acts as a spring. So when wind blows on plant number one, for instance, and pulls it in that direction, you know, that will cause some stress on the plant. But because of this, this can stretch. So the tendrils themselves are stretchy. And in this configuration, there's just a lot of friction on that ring so that's never going to come off especially not on something that's not smooth this is kind of hairy and bristly so that will provide some give and flexibility without letting the whole structure get blown apart and then you have this tendril here which belongs to plant two it's sort of like a response to that one from plant number one and it's coiled around this plastic uh, smooth support column so plastic can work and this essentially confirms that tendrils do react uh, to touch. So they're sensitive to touch. So this is the shoot ape gomera stem of plant two. It's coming along very nicely. And it has this nice tendril that's doing essentially the same thing, but to a plastic support column. So if you look up over here, this other one, it's not very tight. But there's a lot of give here, you know, so it really doesn't need to have that per se. So this loose loop over here, it can stretch. And I don't know how well any of this would hold on to plastic unless it coiled around like two or three times and made contact with the previous coils like this one. Although this one is sort of just getting started too. So this is a close up of this very interesting tendril and it kind of reverses itself mid-coil. It kind of gets tangled and unsettled, kind of like a phone cord does. So I think we need a live demo of this you know, tendril here that sort of has that phone cord action going on. So this plant, plant number one, is dependent somewhat on this tendril, which is called uh, the stem of plant number two, for structural support. So if there's breeze or wind, you know, that helps. Uh, plant number two absorbs some of that pulling energy that could be created by movement from animals or wind, or, you know, just a sparrow landing on top of this or whatever. Likewise, um, there are two tendrils here for plant number two, and they provide support as well. You know, this goes both ways. I mean, when plant number two sways, plant number one will adjust there as well, so. So let me demonstrate, you know, plant number one sways in the wind or a large locust or bird lands on it. You know, it kind of bends and plant two bends. It sways too. But if I apply force to plant number two, plant number one sways as well, so. It's kind of a, you know, self-helping system in some cases, but in this case, it's sort of like the honeydew vines are neighbors that are helping each other out. So there's a fungus snap on the underside of the first true leaf from this regenerated shoot system for plant number three. And I don't think these things feed on plants. It's basically, it has nowhere else to go. I just laid a lot of sand over my potato experiments and you know the first video just came out for about sweet potatoes they've been kind of slow to take off but 
check that out if you're interested in potato growing or development. So basically, the first true leaf is much smaller here, and the second true leaf has gotten much larger over the last you know, six or seven days. What's interesting about this one is there's a marrow stem there and there. If you look to where the plastic tip is pointing, let me just chase this little bugger away. Okay, so you can see the shoot apical marrow stem in the middle more clearly now. It's right there. You know, that fly just won't go away. It's going to get more crowded in this pot as time goes on, but this is the second true leaf from this shoot apical marrow stem that was regenerated. It's growing larger. Uh, the first true leaf, which is the one on the right, is much darker, but it's kind of stunted in growth. This whole complex is sort of stunted in growth. So my estimate is the leaf on the right is about two centimeters long and maybe slightly less uh, wide but you can still see those mini cotyledons so this is just very interesting and because this system is uh, so compact it's really hard to see I assume these petioles will get longer and they need to if the plant is to have a future otherwise it kinda looks like a honeydew bonsai which would be really cool actually and I might try that in later experiments but for now, I'd just like to see this thing thrive, so I have three fully functional vines. Okay, it's day 106 of this honeydew germination experiment, and this pot is finally starting to look vibrant. It's healthy. All three vines are starting to fill out and occupy this pot, making it look not so barren anymore. So this is the shoot apical meristem of plant number one. It's a very long tendril reaching out and this plant is basically exceeding its boundaries. Um, if it gets too far out of line, I'll reconfigure it and uh, push it back in. So plant number one has made a full circle. It has a kink here and you know, it's been all the way around through that, you know, gar garble mess and it finally ends up here. So it's fairly long now. You know, I would say, let's see, Probably two and a half feet if I were just to guess. You know, not quite a meter or anything like that, but maybe, you know, 60, 70 centimeters, uh, 75 maybe. So it has these very long tendrils that are just kind of whipping around and looking for substrates to bind to. And, you know, there's one hanging off the edge here that's very long as well. This is plant number two, the shoot apical meristem. Let's get the light away for a moment so you can see the color. It's also doing really well. It's uh, very vibrant. It's basically doing the same thing and sending tendrils everywhere. We covered this earlier. This is basically like a telephone cord and it's more stretched out now because this kind of got pulled over by plant number one. So one observation I have is that the stem of plant one is just so much more thick and robust and it always was that way because this was the most dominating plant um, early on and you know I'm not convinced that it has anything to do with genetic variation it's just that um, plant number two had that nasty you know tear injury right there and basically its development was uh, stunted in many ways so its stem isn't anywhere as near as thick as that of plant number one. And plant number three, you know, it's the shortest and has fared the worst of them all, but it's regenerating a lot. But before I get into plant number three, I'm tilting the light here, and uh, this is um, basically towards more towards the beginning of plant number one with a thick stem. There's a marrow stem here that's showing some activity. And I'm wondering if that's because uh, the shoot apical marrow stem is so far away now. You know, it's, uh, I don't know, probably like 40, 50 centimeters away. You know, maybe even longer. I'm thinking this vine is probably longer than I'm stating. Um, not quite a meter, but, uh, you know, maybe 80 centimeters or even 90. If I were to uncoil this whole thing, which I can't without damaging it. So... Basically, the source of auxin suppression is far away now, 
and maybe this can branch out and grow in a different direction and this plant can start developing laterally and as the shoot apical meristem gets even further away in the future you, know, you can go downstream or uh, upstream depending on how you look at it so yeah that looks a little longer and more robust than normal I wouldn't be surprised if that started developing into something so this is the one I was just talking about it's looking to bust out and develop a sort of a, not a branch but you know another vine on its own uh, this one is a little elongated one no down and let's see if I can get a good look here this one looks like it's still perfectly suppressed so what a difference two nodes makes if you go more towards the root system Let's see like right here I don't really see anything it's just a bad angle I guess uh, yeah I don't really see anything going on here it there could be something going on so one thing that kind of bothers me is this is a, a really new leaf you know it's actually yeah wow this thing grows so fast it this is the shoot apical meristem of plant number one so if we go back to this leaf, why is it kind of wrinkled in these two lines like that? I don't really get that. Um, I've heard some ridiculous sounding theories like if there's too much pesticides or chemicals in the soil, they'll suck water due to the osmotic gradient and suck the water right out of the plant. But, you know, these plants are obviously not dying from lack of water. And, you know, if I were to dig up this sand right now, the mulch even on the top would just be so wet um, still after you know three or four weeks of not watering um, if you look at this new leaf on plant number two look over here you know these leaves on uh, new leaves on plant number one aren't nearly as green as the more mature established ones that are closer to the ground and this leaf that was supporting plant number three it's just so dark green in comparison so here's a close-up of the amazing regeneration story of the shade apical meristem for plant 3. So this leaf is growing quite nicely. You know, I'd say it's about 3 centimeters in diameter. Um, here's another true leaf that's developing. There's a shade apical meristem right there, making uh, probably two more new true leaves. And on the bottom there, you see a dark uh, new true leaf and that's about it so let's see that's one two three the there's three obvious new true leaves you can see from here and two tiny things that look like cotyledons vestigial but um yeah the shoot apical meristem is working like crazy to generate new leaves so the reason these petioles are so short is probably because the plant doesn't have that luxury like the other two vines which have so many functioning leaves right now of making really long petioles so it'll do what it can just to get started right now and if you, even if you look at this uh, petiole leading up to this leaf the factory of this plant you know that's really really dark green so basically I think after this thing gets going it'll start growing normally like a vine instead of like a bonsai and you know it'll climb all the other leaves and basically work its way on top of the canopy so it looks like we're well on our way to having three dominant vines three healthy vines um, go all the way to the end for this project 